Today we're talking about uh, the basics of CNC turning. We're going to introduce some machines uh, and how they operate to extend your knowledge that you already have from manual turning. So let's get started. First, uh, the essential question here is really how do we classify a CNC machine or what do we talk about? What makes a CNC turning center a CNC turning center? And then what are the different types of it? So that's really what we're going to be exploring uh, in this presentation. And the objectives for it are for you to be able to basically ID and describe the different CNC machine types uh, for turning. Also to be able to uh, identify some of the parts of a CNC turning machine. Identify the machine axes that are used for turning. And demonstrate an understanding of how tools are held and mounted for CNC turning. And last, talk a little bit about some of the different work holding devices we use in CNC turning. They're very similar to what you've learned on a manual lathe. In fact, most of this is very similar. So let's start out with that idea. What's the difference between CNC and manual turning? Well, in a CNC machine, the spindle rotation is exactly the same. The spindle rotates forward. It's generally rotating forward uh, in a clockwise rotation. Uh, and the z-axis aligns with that orientation of rotation. The x-axis is typically in and out. We don't often use a y-axis unless we're going to use live tooling and do some uh, milling operations or milling style operations in our turning center. Now what is very different is the tool is typically positioned behind and upside down the work. And the reason for that uh, is because the tool is on the opposite side, it allows our right hand tool to still operate like a right hand tool. It's just upside down on the other side. It's been rotated around to the back of the machine. So what is the difference between a manual lathe and a CNC lathe and a turning center? And as we remember in a manual lathe, you, the operator, provided all the motion, all the tool changes. Now sometimes you're guided by a digital readout uh, to help you in orienting your work but you did it all. When we move to a CNC lathe, we now have a controller and a computer that provides motion, but the operator still has to change the tools. If we advance further to a turning center, well now the computer provides the motion, but it also changes tools using an automatic tool changer. And the takeaway here is, is that to move from a CNC lathe to a turning center, we have to add an automatic tool changer. That's what makes it a turning center. So here's an example of a CNC lathe. Uh, you'll see the red handles are all, are all places where a human can grab and turn and adjust the lathe and look at the readout up on the display. Uh, they're also what turns automatically when the machine is being controlled by the computer. The tool post looks very similar to a wedge style tool post or a Loris style tool post that you saw on your manual lathes. It has a manual tailstock. So very similar to your manual lathe that you're familiar with. So making a turning center, we add a tool changer. And there's a few different types of tool changers we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about a turret style, a gang style, and a Swiss style or Swiss type. So let's look at the first one here. We're looking at a, a turret type uh, tool changer. And we're really going to talk about two types. One that can support live tooling and one that does not. So on a turret type uh, tool changer here, we've got this big rotary turret that rotates around into position. Uh, it can rotate either towards you or away from you. So if you're standing there looking at it and the tool comes over the top towards you, that's a forward rotation. If the tool rotates uh, up and away from you, that's a, a reverse rotation. Uh, the tools may be live. They may rotate themselves. You'll see some live tooling in the lower right-hand corner of this picture down here where my cursor's flashing. That's a live tool. The live tooling may be oriented along the axis, the z-axis, or it may actually be off at an angle like these ones in the top are. Uh, I can have more than one turret in a machine. I can have a couple different turrets. I can have a couple different spindles. Uh, these can hold a lot of tools. Ours holds 12 tools, has 12 tool stations, uh, and that's a fairly small bolt-on turret. Now, the common turrets here that we're going to talk about are bolt-on and VDI. So let's start with bolt-on. Bolt-on just means that the tools are literally bolted into position on the turret. Uh, 
they can point along the z-axis or along the x-axis. There's no live tooling in a bolt-on uh, style turret. Now the other one that we're going to talk about is VDI. Uh, that stands for Verin Deutscher Ingenieur. I can't really say that. Not sure. VDI. Uh, VDI basically means that the tools clamp into position and they have a lot of capability with live tooling because they transmit power uh, into the turret center. So we look at a bolt-on tool or a bolt-on turret style. This happens to be a Haas one that's depicted. You can see there's many different tool holders that can be bolted on for face grooving, a boring bar, uh, twin bores two turning tools and parting tools, those can all be bolted on uh, to a hose. This, as an example, is a, is a uh, boring tool holder right here. Now their attributes are they're pretty simple. They're pretty simple to put together and maintain. You bolt them on. Uh, and that's a positive and a negative because they're simple, they can't allow live tooling. Uh, the cost, definitely a benefit. This is by far the cheapest option for your tools and your tool holding. Uh, the setup, uh, it's kind of a drawback. It does take a little bit more work if you swap out the tool out of place to, to re-zero the tool and reset it up. Uh, VDI is indexed, so it'll go in a little easier. So here's a VDI style tool, and uh, biggest attribute here is they are fast and accurate tool changes. Huge positive. So you basically uh, roll the tool in and out in the entire holder, and the holder seats into position, so it's repeatable. Uh, the other interesting thing about this is we can transmit power. So you see right here is a live 90 degree drill for a uh, VDI style uh, turret. Now, the big drawback here is, as you can imagine, more complex, more expensive, but certainly worthwhile, a uh, huge game changer to be able to do live tooling in a lathe. Now, gang style turning, uh, this is where the tools literally are built up together on a gang, and that's what's shown over here on the right-hand side. Now, it may be in a Swiss style where the tools are fixed, or it may be a conventional style where the tools move. But the tools are all grouped together on one big block, and that block can move back and forth. So in this picture, the block can move back and forth, and it may move in or out depending on the style of the machine, conventional versus a Swiss turning machine. Now, almost all, and I say almost all, modern CNC turning centers are slant bed. And all that that means is instead of the x-axis being flat like it was on a manual lathe uh, in, that you actuated using your cross slide wheels, uh, the bed is tilted up uh, somewhere around a 45 degree angle. And it's very common, almost all CNC turning centers have that. And the reason for that is basically the chips fall down by gravity. They flow down, so you don't have to spend a lot of time getting the chips out. You can put a chip conveyor on the machine. Uh, the tools are typically behind the work, and the tools are upside down because they are behind the work. Now, just because you have one turret on a CNC turning center doesn't mean that's all you can have. You can have multiple turrets, and you're going to have multiple spindles. So in this example, uh, and some of the videos I ask you to watch, show multi-turret, multi-spindle machines. So here I have a front spindle, where my cursor is flashing, a rear spindle, an upper turret, and a lower turret. And this happens to have an X, a Y, and a Z motion. So why would you have a multi-turret, multi-spindle machine? And really the, the short answer is, is because you can finish the part in a single operation. Uh, you can never take the part out of the machine. You can go ahead and machine one side of it uh, in the primary turret and then move the secondary turret forward, grab the part, pull it out, and then machine the other side of it. Uh, with your secondary turret. Typically your turrets, like your upper turret in this instance, is lined up with the primary uh, spindle. The uh, lower turret is lined up with the secondary spindle. 
So very much more complex to program, but uh, very efficient at making a mass number of high quality parts because your setup never changes. Now we mentioned a Swiss style or Swiss type turning center and all that refers to uh, is a Swiss type turning center is optimized to make very, very small slender parts. And the reason it works for small slender parts is that stick out rule that we're familiar with where if we stick the part out more than about three times the diameter, and that's a rule of thumb, it starts to chatter and vibrate and deflect. So to get around that, a Swiss style machining machine moves the stock into the tool instead of the tool into the stock. And what it uses is a series of, of uh, collets, one that chucks and one that guides or a bushing that guides the part out to the tool. So the workpiece moves in and out while the tool stays fixed. And you'll see that later on in the video. Uh, this basically minimizes the stick out for small parts, so it's really optimal to make small diameter parts. Now this Swiss setup can have multiple tools that are associated with it, and it can have live tooling as well. Uh, and the tools may move up and down and left and right, so you'll see there's an X and a Y movement here. Uh, and also move in Z and X. It just depends on the machine. But the stock is always moving to the tool. In this instance, this Swiss style turning machine uh, has to get one set of tools out of the way of the other. Hence the reason that the bottom tool set moves in Z and X and the top tool set moves in X and Y. Now the tools that we're holding are no different than what you're familiar with already. And we can talk about outside diameter tools first, meaning OD. Uh, they're all insert based. We don't use any high speed steel at all in a CNC machine or a turning center because of the higher speeds, higher production rates, higher cut capacity. But they're still right, left, and uh, neutral. So as you look at the top diagram, the right hand tool still points to the left as you look at it from the top. Now realize it's upside down in the machine. Neutral points straight ahead and left hand uh, points to the right. Now we use these for turning, facing, grooving, cutoff. Uh, one thing I didn't mention back here is we can also have uh, cutoff tools down here and they can be left hand or right hand. Uh, grooving and cutoff tools, most grooving tools are neutral, meaning that it cuts a flat slot. So you see down where my cursor is flashing. If it's left handed, that means that it's biased to the right. It will cut off the uh, right hand side of the cut of the groove first. That's used to minimize the amount of burrs. Uh, in our shop, we use almost all neutral tools for cutoff and also for uh, grooving because then we can kind of interchange them. You can use the same tool for the same uh, for the two different operations. Now, tools that cut on the inside diameter or boring or or hole making tools or basically drills uh, in our CNC machines. We typically shank hold these uh, and you'll see that the shank fits right into the boring bar holder and then they're uh, almost all call it held. It's pretty rare to see a, uh, a drill head in a CNC turning center. So we use collets to hold our drill bits and uh, hold our taps and some other things that are associated with what we would term drilling operations uh, in a mill. Uh, we also may use a boring bar. That may or may not be mounted in, the, uh, in, a, in a round block like what's shown there. Uh, but they're all insert based uh, and I've got that down there twice. Uh, they're generally held aligned with the Z axis, so they, they cut along the Z axis, the boring bars do and the drills do. So those are inside diameter tools and they're not that dissimilar from what you saw in a manual lathe. Now one thing that's a little bit different, on our manual lathe it was not compensated for diameter, for the uh, RPM. So we kind of estimated and we used a lot of averages. So if I was going to turn a part down from one inch to three quarters of an inch, I may use three quarters of an inch diameter for my cut speed, uh, realizing I'm going to cut a little too fast when I'm at one inch and I'm going to cut about right when I'm three quarters of an inch. 
or halfway between 1 inch and 0.75 uh, to calculate my RPM. So my RPM is always calculated by my SFM or my uh, cubic or my, my uh, surface feet per minute times 3.82 divided by the diameter of the stock. So CNC lathes are typically programmed to adjust the RPM as the diameter decreases. Now, I'll tell you, you always want to set a maximum on this, and the reason for that is as your diameter gets smaller, your machine's going to speed up, and you can speed it up to a point where you wouldn't want it that fast. So we always limit the speed on our CNC lathe. That's a little bit different. We can make the CNC lathe, you'll learn about in G-code later on, use a constant RPM or a constant SFM. Uh, one of the two is how we program it. So the question here is if we're facing a part down, what's the RPM as a facing tool approaches zero? And the answer is it's infinite. Uh, so you just have to be aware of that potential. So for work holding, uh, really no different than it was on the manual lathes, except everything's hydraulically closed. So you can have a three jaw or six jaw chuck. That's very, very common. Uh, custom cut jaws to hold the part. What's shown right down here, you'll see there's an arc cut in those. Uh, and then as the draw bar pulls on the chuck, it clamps closed. Now another uh, option, and the one that we have mounted in our ST10, is a collet based chuck. So a collet based chuck works exactly like the collet on your mill, uh, conventional mill that you learned, and the call it on the CNC mill, except it's a chuck. It's much larger, so we use a uh, 16 size uh, call it, which is a pretty good size. It'll hold up to an inch and a half uh, worth of stock. But what you do need to be aware of is it's pretty hard to orient this thing uh, perfectly in Z because as you close the call it, the piece tends to get sucked in here. And as the piece, even if I use a collet stop, as the piece, uh, uh, as the piece gets smaller, the face of the collet moves as it comes down in. So it can be a little tricky to set up the Z uh, on a collet, but we use them because they're really, really easy to get a very, very concentric mount. They're also very stable at high speed and very strong. So with a three jaw or six jaw, you just gotta be aware that your, your chuck has a maximum speed and you can spin it faster than it was designed and it won't hold the part. You also have to understand that as you get into very high speeds with very large chucks, uh, you know, in the 6,000 RPM range, the jaws have quite a bit of inertia. That effect is to effectively loosen your grip on the part. So there's a big old chart that we look at to calculate how much hydraulic pressure we need to close on the part. So speed is important with our chuck-based CNC work holding in a lathe. Okay, a couple other big ideas here is we're going to talk about some different styles of controls. Now, we hadn't spoken about that all the way up till now. We've just looked, focused on our Haas controls, but I'm going to introduce a few different pictures of controls. Just so you understand that the Haas control is not the only one out there. Uh, the leader by far in America is the Fanuc control. Uh, Fanuc is a Japanese company that uh, produces automation equipment, PLCs, robotic arms, uh, and it's pretty much the industry standard. It's a G-code or ISO based uh, software uh, system. Haas has some visual programming or, or uh, conversational programming guides that they built in top of it, but the Fanuc control itself is ISO based. Uh, this is actually a Fanuc controller here. You'll notice that it, it's mechanized a little bit different than a Haas, but you'll also see a lot of the same buttons that we have. So over here you got a program button, an offset, uh, you've got an input, a delete button, uh, graphics, me uh, message, so system or setup diagnostic button. So pretty similar. So that's a Fanuc control. Well, Haas control, that's G-code uh, only also, but 
it uh, does have some conversational programming in some macros that are built in, like for probing and some other things. Uh, there's two different styles for the Haws that are uh, out there right now, and that's uh, basically a classic control, which is what's shown in the picture. That's uh, our lathe. Uh, a little more limited in the graphics area, a little less intuitive to run, but overall, not bad. And then the next gen, which was tab based on our mill. Uh, very, very common control. The buttons, all the functions, everything is almost identical from machine to machine. Whether you're running uh, $500,000, uh, 750 or a, a uh, you know, $30,000 tool room lathe, uh, the controls on them are identical and the operation is very similar. So that's a big advantage between a Haas control. You can tell a Haas control right away because the word Haas on it. Another one, it's quite a bit more conversational, meaning that you can tell it what you want to do and type in some parameters, uh, more menu-driven, is uh, Mazak. Now, uh, Mazak control is actually mostly used by or Siemens as their controller now. So Siemens and Mazak are very, very similar. Uh, but this is a little different because almost all the operations are done on these soft keys up here. So you see the soft keys, these changing keys. So we had those fixed keys on a Haas panel. This is a lot of soft keys. But it's, uh, it, it's a good control. So more soft keys. Uh, also a lot more conversational programming. Now Siemens, Siemens puts out some really awesome controllers. These are very graphical. Uh, in fact, the latest one is almost like looking at a PC screen uh, and tabbing around for menus. Uh, but it is a conversational or G-code. It can swap in between. They've got a lot of advanced features on here. Used on some very high-end machines like DMG Mori. Uh, also happens to be used that exact same language is used on robotic arms, so it's very handy if you're going to integrate a robotic arm. Uh, these are pretty expensive machines, like a DMG Mori. That's, that's not an inexpensive machine. And then the last control system I'll talk about is a uh, Akuma, and uh, this is very, very powerful. Uh, and a Japanese uh, machine tool manufacturer who makes all their own automation components and controls, uh, and it is very graphical. Uh, similar to a Siemens, except it has a lot of built-in features that make it good for really, really fine machining operations. Things like thermal compensation, uh, checking how hot the bearings are, and then compensating for that. Uh, predicting collision avoidance by knowing where all of the machine components are. Uh, detecting when something's vibrating too much and changing the program or warning you of that. So, Okuma is very, very powerful. Again, high-end machines. Very graphical, almost like a PC. So, to wrap this lesson up, what I want you to do is to basically finish the textbook reading for this section. It's supported by this presentation and very similar. And then submit your, uh, submit your assignment for that textbook reading. Thanks for watching. After this, we'll move on to some basic CNC programming and operations on the lathe.